Hello, my name is Megan Eisenhower and I am sitting down with hardcore Americana musician Tim Erickson, who is an artist in residence this week here at Northwest. Tim, we're happy to have you here. I'm happy to be here, thanks. So what does an artist in residence do exactly? I've been visiting a number of classes and doing some public presentations as well. Last night we had a singing that was, I would say, equal parts um, uh, students and community members and just really open to anyone. We had a great time and I'll be doing a performance on Friday evening. All right, well I've seen you've been working with the choir students here. Is there any new techniques you've brought to them? Uh, not that I'd have a name for, probably singing a little bit differently because I don't know how to sing <laughs> any other way in particular, but um, yeah, I think, well, the, one of the things, the thing that we've been focusing on is shape note or sacred harp singing, which is a four-part harmony style, I guess you'd broadly speaking would say early American sacred music that's a social singing tradition. Mm -hmm. And so there are a few different techniques involved in that and, and just some different music. What exactly uh, is the Sacred Harp? Or okay, the Sacred Harp is the name of a tune book that's been sung from continuously since it was first published in the mid 19th century. A lot of the music is older, uh, mostly American music. And it's a loose, uh, Sacred Harp singers are just kind of a loosely affiliated bunch of people who like singing from that book. Mm -hmm. And we sing, we get together and sing socially. There's very little uh, organization to it beyond just uh, interest and coming together and, and singing. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. It is. So you've been involved with the American folk um, sound for a while now. What got you started on that? Purely interest, I think, in the sounds, the stories um, that, that are in some of these older songs. And uh, I'm interested in history. And I was looking, among other things, for something that I could use as a jumping off point uh, for my own creativity. So it's partly something that I'm interested in learning about and it's partly something that I'm interested in incorporating just in my own creative work. Awesome. So you walked into the studio with the guitar, which to me means you're super musically inclined. What's your favorite instrument out of all the ones you play? Because I know you're into the violin, the fiddle, the banjo. Yeah, it depends on the day. Mm -hmm. And usually in a, any given concert I'll play, if I have, it depends on how many instruments I have with me, how many I can carry. <laughs> but uh, I usually play three or four. Um, I lately have been getting re-excited about the electric guitar, which was sort of my first love as far as instruments go. It's just a little harder to carry around because you have to have an amp and everything. <laughs> Too much stuff. Yeah. So before you got started on your solo career, you were in a band called Cordelia's Dad. Yeah. How is the sound that the band had different from your own solo take? Well, the band was, unusual. It still sort of exists mm -hmm. in this kind of twilight world of occasional performances and uh, we see each other at Sacred Harp Singings all the time. We're all involved in that. Um, but the band is, one of the things that's kind of unusual about it is that it has two very distinct sides. So from the, from the beginning we had an extremely acoustic side that featured things like solo, unaccompanied ballad singing mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know acoustic instruments and harmony singing. And that's something, all things that have carried into my, my solo work. The other side of the band was very electric, kind of melodic post-punk stuff. Sometimes playing old traditional songs, just very loud. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes playing original music that in one way or another connected with that. And the way that that plays out in my solo work is that I've been incorporating more of my own songs and finding mm -hmm. ways of um, establishing links between these different genres and um, both in terms of uh, musical structure and also s ways of storytelling. So it all kind of, it's all kind of wrapped up together. So what made you want to separate from Cordelia's dad and start your own solo career? Um, <clears throat> I didn't really want to, but the uh, drummer moved. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then I moved and then the bass player moved to England. And it was, you know, somewhat of a pragmatic move mm -hmm. that I could just blow into town with a guitar and a fiddle or something and, and do a solo show and it's um, uh, it's much less complicated and I guess a little bit more financially workable to be mm -hmm. a solo musician. But I still play with um, all kinds of different people and I, I love collaborating. Good. All right, so you have your PhD and tell me if I say this right, entho-musicology? I 
almost have a PhD oh, in my ethnomusicology. Bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, I am ABB, ABD, which <clears throat> sometimes joke ADD, but um, <laughs> it's yeah, I'm, I'm getting getting close. Getting close. Yeah. And so you travel, not, you're not just traveling around the States for teaching people, but you've also gone to Poland and the Czech Republic. Yeah, I travel a lot in Europe. I was mm -hmm. in Singapore in May, um, and I, yeah, I'd, I'd say about equal parts mm -hmm. Europe and the U.S. and very occasionally elsewhere, which is fun. So uh, what piece of, of advice do you take to all those different students who are trying to get into the music career? Um, I, I think... Well, okay, one, one thing is that, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I love music so much, I want to mm -hmm. make all my money from it. So I tell them, okay, so, like, flip that around and say, like, I love my mom so much, I want to make all my money from her. <laughs> yeah, like, her. They're different things. You know, you love something and you want to have it in your life, but um, wanting, needing, the, the need to make all your money from it is, you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't have to do that to have music in your life. So I, I encourage people to just, just don't stop. Just keep doing it. And opportunities may come up. They may, there may be money involved, there may not be, but um, I've, I think for me anyway, it's been useful to keep focused on the work. So you've had the chance to work on a award-nominated soundtrack for Cold Mountain. What was that like? Yeah, it was a neat opportunity. It's one in a long series of things that seem like dreams in retrospect. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one story I sometimes tell uh, on stage as an example of the strangeness of my life is that in one week there were two stories one of which was a dream and one of which which actually happened mm -hmm. and the first story is that I'm in Transylvania under full moon it's midnight Nicole Kidman is dancing to Eminem oh lovely somebody has put a large pile of meat out in front of the house <laughs> and somebody starts shouting bear and we all go running around to the front and there's an enormous bear there and uh, then Nicole Kidman and a bunch of movie, movie stars go chasing after the bear down the street so the other story is I'm at Home Depot choosing tile, <laughs> and that the uh, latter one was the dream, mm -hmm. and the first one actually happened. <laughs> you can actually see video of it on my YouTube channel. I Just chasing have... a bear. Yeah, uh, that, but I mean, uh, it, it, was, it was a terrific experience. It was a learning experience. It was really interesting just to kind of see the inner workings of a, of a huge film like that. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed all the people that I worked with. And it was a beautiful soundtrack. I listened to it oh, last night. I'm it was glad. well done. Um, so you got to go to the Academy Awards for it since you helped uh, produce, collaborate on it. What was that like? Um, it, was, it was, again, it was funny. I brought, uh, you know, 40 of my friends to perform on the Academy Awards with uh, Elvis Costello and Thibaut Burnett and Alison Krauss. And, uh, you know, we were downstairs, up, you know, like, passing Sean Penn in the elevator and stuff, and we're, we're downstairs just singing, just having fun. And strangely enough, I didn't even break a sweat when we were on stage. There, I've had, uh, I was saying the other day that I did like a, a 9 a.m. school assembly for a, a, a middle school in the Oregon desert, and I was much more nervous about that than <laughs> I was about the, the Academy Awards, but it was, it was fun. That's so cool. So this is more of a question for me yeah. than anyone else, but did you get to meet Jack White? I worked a lot with Jack. Oh. Yeah. He played, my son at the time was, um, my older son was six months old when we started working on the project, and so we hung out in the studio a lot and sang with Jack on some stuff. And then in the film, my son actually wound up playing Jack's son at the end, so I had to hang out with him a lot and get them used to each other. And um, I, I, I like him. I, I like working with him. He's a good That's player. awesome. That's super cool to me. Yeah. So what led you to want to start um, getting into music? Um, I didn't really think about it, but uh, I was around it all the time. And my mm -hmm. parents sang. They were always the loudest people around. <laughs> Not necessarily the best singers, but uh, they, they just, just assumed that you would sing. And um, I started finding my own way, I guess, pretty early on, just experimenting and playing around with things. And, and over time, it, it uh, just took up more and more of my life. It wasn't a real decision. What was your first instrument you picked up? I had a, a very broken acoustic guitar that somebody had left behind and somehow we had acquired and, and it had, I don't know, three or four strings and the mm -hmm. neck was like pulling away from the body of the thing. And, and so I just experimented making sounds on it. We also had a piano in the house that was not particularly in tune and I had no idea how to play it. So again, <laughs> I just, you know, was plucking the strings on the inside and uh, yeah, my first experiences with instrumental music were really kind of experimental. Awesome. So, um, uh, what does hardcore Americana mean? 
Well, it's a kind of a phony term that I made up <laughs> because Americana has come to be at least vaguely recognized as a term. You have a sense of it. It's mm -hmm. connected to, to some kind of older musical forms. And uh, I chose hardcore Americana for two reasons. I started out, my first bands that I played in when I was really making my own music were hardcore punk bands. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the term hardcore. I mean, you know, it has all kinds of things you don't want to Google, but um, um, it... I suppose implies uh, getting down to maybe the, the bones of the thing, the, 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 the core of, of the music. And so it seemed appropriate to describe at least the part of my music that involves things like solo unaccompanied ballad singing, very exposed, very um, kind of disciplined um, music. Um, so what drives you to keep performing after all these years? Um, what else would I do? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not going to get a job. So um, you have a different type of music taste. You like it goes from folk, punk, rock, jazz, even some gospel. Do you, on your albums, do you focus more on one type of sound, or do you like to mix it up? Um, it depends on the album, and I have albums where part of the the, in a way, the regimen, uh, or the rubric, any whatever the word is, is making connections and finding, not just inventing them, but finding historical and aesthetic and and uh, spiritual connections between the different sounds, the different um, histories, the, the different forms. And then there are other albums that are very, very focused on one thing. I did an album, I was for years trying to make this album and I, was, I finally got to the point where I felt I could do it. And it's 14 unaccompanied solo songs that I recorded in one take when I was uh, staying in a Polish monastery in, in near the Ukraine border. So it's just one thing. It's like, I sang a song, what do I want to sing next? Okay, next. Um, so it kind of traces that, that, that moment uh, very um, rigorously as opposed to trying to find broader connections. So what led you to start taking your um, teaching skills overseas? Was it just because you were touring or was it more of you wanted to spread what you've learned? Um, opportunities arose, I guess, and uh, I enjoy, I often say yes to things that don't make any sense <laughs> and they more often than not they wound up they wind up being interesting and yeah partly partly pursuing interests and partly just taking advantage of opportunities or creating opportunities that maybe don't seem completely intuitive but I've had enough experience where things work out beautifully uh, like teaching for example sacred harp singing at a week-long early music festival in, again in southeastern Poland mm -hmm. it was a little bit counterintuitive that, that it would work but people really loved it and they, they've kept up singing there so now, you know, it, it takes something pretty crazy for me to say, I don't know that I've actually said no to anything in recent years. So you worked on a, also a Grammy-nominated album. You collaborated with Omar Sosa. Um, what's it like being able to work with big leagues in the music industry like Nirvana and Weezer and all them? Um, it, it really varies, but it's like everything is like high school in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, every little scene is like high school. It's like you got the cheerleaders and the jocks and the, and the class president, and, and it's kind of... I Maybe mean, that's a dumb way of saying it, but but even with working on Cold Mountain, it's kind of the same way. When you're in that situation, those are the people you're with. Mm -hmm. There's often a kind of a funny pecking order, and you have to kind of um, navigate that. But it's in a way, it's not that different from stuff that we're all kind of used to. It's it's just sometimes have to remember, you know, um, not so much in the rock scene because people are usually more low key, but. When you when working with somebody like Nicole Kidman or something, where it it actually really makes a difference to their life, how you treat them, and that little things like you know autographs and pictures and all that stuff, if people get into that, it would just ruin their life. Mm -hmm. Every second of their day, they'd be walking down the street and they wouldn't have any time to do anything else. So just I think learning, it's been an opportunity to learn a little bit about how to uh, how to find ways of interacting with people. And was it your band, Cordelia's Dad, or your solo act traveled around with Nirvana? You were like an opening act? We, we opened for them. That's a whole other, whole other story. And at the time, it was like, you know, another night. Yeah. It's only in retrospect. And it actually is pretty interesting to think back. I was actually looking at some videos from the early 90s the other day on YouTube and thinking, wow, that was a... I was swimming in it at the time. Wherever you are, it mm -hmm. doesn't seem that weird. Like, you guys are probably used to the desert here. I look at this stuff and I'm like, man, people <laughs> live here. This is unbelievable. And it's the same kind of thing, you know, it's just, there you are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just, yeah, it's just <laughs> life at the moment. Well, it's really interesting. So your last album, Banjo, Fiddle, and the Voice, was released in 2012. 
do you have any, are you working on any new EPs or albums right now? I'm new working, on, I'm always kind of working on all kinds of things. I, I did three in, in 2012. Uh, I've been working on a theater piece that involves, um, I have a trio that plays music from a, uh, an imaginary New England village. And so we play music from, from that place that we've learned from imaginary friends, and uh, some of which is original, some of which is kind of traditional music. We have a theater piece that involves a magic lantern show. Magic lanterns are these 19th century and earlier, uh, sort of like a, an early slide projector. So paintings on glass that are then projected with, a, uh, you know, there's a flame and then they're projected on a, on a screen. Um, I'm also working on an album with the trio, and I, I did a, I did an album I've abandoned the Czech Republic that I produced uh, a little bit ago. I sometimes play with them, and uh, I don't know. I'm probably missing something. But I, I, I've always got you know a bunch of things. So, do you still collaborate with some of your old band members at all? I do. Yeah, I just did a show with Cordelia's dad just last week. Good old-fashioned punk rock show. It was great to get out the electric guitar, and uh, the drummer in that band is also my lawyer. <laughs> So I get to you That's know <laughs> hang out in his office and sign things, and he he's also the percussionist in uh, this trio, the trio to Pumpkin Town that plays music from an imaginary village. So mm -hmm. he periodically plays hooky. He came with us to Singapore and a couple times to the west, just like recent months, a couple times to the west coast and out to uh, uh, Michigan. So you know he's sitting there on his iPhone, you know, doing deals and everything, and then we go <laughs> play music. So do you play more um, folk festivals, or does it? Mess, do you mess around, mix it up with punk and some jazz? and? Um, it kind of depends on the month or the year. Mm -hmm. I'd say probably more kind of folky stuff. Those are just the opportunities that come up more, and that's probably that's what I'm more known mm -hmm. for. So the jazz thing, I couldn't tell you the first thing about jazz. <laughs> I, I just had this serendipitous encounter with Omar Sosa, and we really hit it off. Yeah. And um, next thing I knew, I was making an album, and we got nominated for Best World Music and Best Latin Jazz. Mm -hmm. And I could not tell you the first thing about Latin jazz <laughs> other than <laughs> my friend Omar and I made an album that I guess is in some way Latin jazz. So you've performed at Red Rocks. Yeah. The Kodak Theater. Yeah. The Lincoln, uh, hold on, Lincoln Center Rose Hall yep. and Carnegie Hall. Yeah. What's it like to be able to perform at places like that? Well, it's different. Red Rocks is, was great. Isn't it cool was, outside? Oh, so nice. All the lights and the stars. That was really, that was one of, one of my favorite gigs on that tour. That was with Ralph Stanley and Alison Krauss and this big, you know, 10 tour buses or 12 <laughs> buses. And, you know, we were traveling with our own lights and sound system and stages and whatever. And uh, it was neat to be able to do a tour like that. It was really easy. <laughs> for me, because I just like hang out in the dressing room and like, oh, we got to go sing, you know. <laughs> um, the the Carnegie Hall thing scared me half to death. I don't get sure. scared too easily, but singing with uh, the symphony orchestra, I was completely out of my depth. Uh, I was talking about this a couple times recently that you know it was like one of those dreams where you go to school and you've forgotten to like put on your clothes or whatever. It was like that times. It's actually happening, and I'm t completely incompetent in this situation, but. Uh, it, yeah, it was, it was great. It was like once I got over the first 30 seconds of the song and I realized like, okay, I'm making sounds. I seem to be singing the song. Um, it was cool. When you get nervous up on stage, do you have anything that you like say to yourself to get the nerves out or any <coughs> no, no. superstitions before you go on stage? Nope. No? No, I don't usually get nervous. I mean, I get nervous in funny... I haven't quite put a finger on what, what things make, make me nervous, but like I said, like this... The Academy Awards, I literally didn't break a sweat for some reason. Uh, I'd be nervous. <laughs> um, well, you, you might or you might not. I, I don't know what it was that, that was not nerve-wracking about mm -hmm. that. I mean, it, it should have been. You know, it was like live broadcast for a bajillion people, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's the kind of thing where you're like, what, what if I fall over? <laughs> you know, whatever. One of the people I was singing with almost fell into the orchestra pit. So oh, gosh. <laughs> that would have been dramatic. Oh, that would have been me. <laughs> but then, you know, if that happens, it's like, you know, mm -hmm. I fell into the orchestra pit on a live broadcast from the Academy Awards. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> people will remember that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, what's, what's it gonna hurt ultimately? So what can people here in the Pal, Cody, Northwest region expect from your show tomorrow night at the Nelson Performing Arts Stage? It's gonna be solo acoustic and I'll be doing some of my own songs. I'll be singing some uh, traditional songs, playing some banjo and some fiddle, some, some familiar stuff, some less familiar. I'll probably sing some songs from Southeastern Europe uh, from the Balkans, another thing that's part of my life that I have increasingly incorporated in, in my shows. And we are blessed with the choir here who's going to come up and sing a couple of songs with me. Oh, that'll be very nice. Well, Tim, yeah. it's been great talking to you. I'm really excited to go to your show tomorrow. And thank you so much yeah, for coming. Yeah, thanks.
I'm Megan Eisenhower, and this is Tim Erickson. Tomorrow night at the Nelson Performing Arts Building, he'll be performing at 7, so everyone be there.